Benford. And I'd like to thank DSM and also the conference organisers for the opportunity to present in the symposium this afternoon, this morning, whatever it is. <laughs> Not sure what time it is. Um, okay, as Manfred said, I'm going to focus on asthma as one of the health effects of air pollution. So I'm going to talk a little bit about asthma, specifically the types of inflammation that are induced by um, air pollution and are relevant to asthma. And then I'm going to do a little bit of an overview of nutritional approaches to managing inflammation in asthma, um, looking specifically at antioxidants. And I'll just briefly touch on uh, omega-3 fatty acids and vitamin D, um, and then um, uh, give you a, a summary in my conclusions on the topic. So if people are um, not already familiar with this, asthma is a highly prevalent disease worldwide. It's particularly prevalent in countries that are westernised. So this map here colour codes the world according to asthma prevalence. And this is the latest available data, but you know, I'm sure that um, these, um, as the changes that occur in um, some of the um, developing countries, as they become more westernised, we're going to see changes in um, prevalence rates in those countries. The latest available data shows us that Australia, New Zealand, uh, North America, some parts of South America, also the UK, all have asthma prevalence over 10%. We also know that when people migrate from a developing country to a westernised country, susceptible individuals will develop asthma. And so that leads us to consider the fact that it must be something to do with the environment that's contributing to asthma. Of course there are certain host factors, so genetics are incredibly important in terms of asthma. If you have asthma in your family, then you're much more likely to develop asthma yourself. Also, gender is important. So as a child, if you're a boy, you're more likely to have asthma. As an adult, you're more likely to have asthma if you're female. So those host things are definitely there and, and very much contribute to the development of the disease. But the fact that we do have this increasing prevalence and you know, this change in prevalence as, as people move to westernised countries suggests that things like allergens, um, infections, particularly in early childhood, occupational exposure, smoking, also air pollution can be, may be contributing to the development of the disease. The other thing that I've been particularly interested in is the role of diet. So we all understand the fact that westernised diets do tend to have a worse nutrient profile. So changes occur in a westernised diet because we rely heavily on processed foods. So we have a reduced intake of foods like fruits and vegetables and whole grains. Um, that changes the nutrient profile. It means we have a lower intake of antioxidants and other phytochemicals. It also means we have a reduced intake of dietary fibre. We also have an alteration in the fatty acid profile. So westernised diets tend to be higher in saturated fats um, and contain trans fats, but lower in healthy fats such as omega-3s. So that also um, contributes to um, impaired protection against inflammatory diseases such as asthma. So if anyone doesn't know um, much about what asthma is, I just wanted to give a couple of charts which briefly describe what the disease involves. So it's a chronic inflammatory disorder of the airways. The, the lungs are the site of um, the disease and in the lungs you have asthma occurring. And the reason for that is that individuals with asthma have an exaggerated immune response to different triggers. So we all get exposed to um, airborne allergens. We all breathe in pollens, um, you know, cat hair, dog hair. We all get exposed to viruses. But, and we also, the topic of this seminar is, in particular is air pollution. We all get exposed to air pollution. And in a person who has um, healthy lungs, they are able to deal with that exposure. But with somebody who has asthma, their immune response is exaggerated and as a result you get inflammation in the airways. 
that leads to the symptoms of asthma. So typically um, chest tightness, cough, breathlessness, wheeze, these are features of asthma that occur when this inflammation um, is present in the lungs. So this chart here just describes, it's just a fit schematic that, it, that describes that phenomena. So here, this is the breathing tube, bronchial tube of somebody with healthy lungs. There's a nice passage um, for air to move in and out of the lungs. On the left hand side, this describes what somebody with asthma, their bronchial tube looks like. So the airway smooth muscle around the outside of the bronchial tube becomes inflamed and twitchy. Um, the epithelium also becomes damaged and then you get excess mucus production. Each of those things prevent the nice passage of air in and out of the lungs. The clinical course of the disease involves um, periods of stability and then intermittent exacerbations, we call them. So some people might know of the term asthma attack. Um, that's what people, um, you know, the general public would normally call when they get um, a worsening of their asthma, they get an asthma attack. Now this describes an acute worsening of symptoms which can be so severe that it, it leads to death and we still do have um, regular deaths um, occurring because of um, asthma exacerbations that happen um, and people aren't able to manage them. So this chart here describes um, or summarises in a quite a simplistic way what happens in terms of inflammation in asthma. So we've talked about the fact that there are different triggers such as allergens, viruses and air pollution. They stimulate different parts of the immune response. So um, allergens, typically um, people understand that asthma is associated with allergens and that stimulates an um, allergic response that's primarily dominated by a type of cell called eosinophils. If you become exposed to air pollution, it's a different type of inflammation that occurs. So Fernando mentioned the fact that you get cells called macrophages become activated when they're exposed to air pollution. Um, you also get neutrophils are also activated. And these cells are present to try and deal with any invading pathogen bacteria, engulf it and get rid of it. But with air pollution, if you're constantly stimulated, or your cells are constantly stimulated, trying to protect your body from these um, airborne particles, you have chronic activation of this type of inflammation. And that means that your airways become chronically inflamed, and that also spills over into the circulation. And you get um, increases in systemic inflammation and systemic oxidative stress. And the consequence of that is that then the disease can move out being beyond the asthma itself and cause damage to end organs such as the heart and lead to cardiovascular disease. So it's what has initially been um, a problem confined to the airways can move into the circulation. This chart here describes um, the um, inflammation that occurs in people who have this type of neutrophilic asthma that's triggered by air pollution. And what we see is compared to healthy people and compared to people who have allergic asthma, you get an increase in systemic inflammation. And that has important consequences because this next chart shows that in people who have high systemic inflammation, they have worse lung function. So these are our markers of lung function and they have worse asthma symptoms. We also see down here that that might be a little bit small for you to, to, um, to read the chart, but what this chart is showing is that people who have this type of inflammation that's induced by air pollution, that increases their risk of cardiovascular disease. So in terms of nutrition, how could we actually address this problem? What are possible approaches to dealing with this situation? So first of all, I'd like to talk about antioxidants because we've done quite a lot of work in this area. So these inflammatory cells that we've talked about, the neutrophils and the macrophages, that become activated, release free radicals. So they're constantly releasing substances like superoxide, uh, the superoxide anion, hydrogen peroxide, and these substances can damage cells. If you have um, adequate antioxidant defences in the host, then that can protect you from this damage. But in asthma, where you've chronically got this activation, this chronic release of free radicals, that means that in time, the host's antioxidant defences get depleted. So that leads us to think, well, could antioxidant therapy be warranted? 
So um, certainly we've got evidence that um, in both uh, plasma, so looking at systemic levels of oxidative stress, you've got an increase in people who have asthma compared to healthy controls. And we also have evidence that in the airways, in sputum, we have increases in oxidative stress in people who have stable asthma, and then this becomes worse when they have an exacerbation. So are antioxidants going to be useful? Well, there's many observational studies that show that there certainly is a deficiency in antioxidants in people who have asthma. So uh, there's studies that show deficiencies in vitamin C, vitamin E, carotenoids, selenium. We've got a study over here that we published looking at carotenoids, and this just shows you the degree of deficiency in these particular nutrients. So here we've got total carotenoids. So if you're not familiar with carotenoids, they're mainly found in fruits and vegetables. They're the um, coloured pigments that are found in fruit and vegetables. And you can see that total carotenoids has dramatically um, decreased in people with asthma. And that's um, each of the different carotenoids that we measured, lutein, beta-cryptoxanthin, lycopene, alpha and beta-carotene, they're all deficient in people with asthma. Now we also measured the dietary intake of these people and they didn't have, the asthmatics had a similar dietary intake to the healthy controls. So that suggests to us that it's increased utilisation because of the oxidative stress that's present. This chart down the bottom, I'm, um, so what that chart down the bottom shows, which you can't see because it's obscured, is that alpha tocopherol is also decreased in people with asthma and the oxidised form of alpha tocopherol, alpha tocopherol quinone, is increased in people with asthma. Again, further evidence of these impaired antioxidant defences. So in terms of intervention, what could be done? There's been a few antioxidant intervention studies in asthma to try and improve um, asthma outcomes and really they've been very disappointing. There's, the antioxidants have been used, so vitamin C, vitamin E, selenium, have really been very disappointing and not made any significant improvements in asthma outcomes. So that's, that's been a problem um, in terms of developing this area of work. But what I wanted to draw your attention to is a study that we published a couple of years ago now, which took a different approach. And rather than saying we're going to put all our eggs in one basket and pick one single antioxidant that might be important in asthma, what we did was a whole food intervention. So we got people to change their diet and they had to go on either a high antioxidant diet or a low antioxidant diet. Now, while we call them high and low, what we were actually doing was, get, was getting people to, um, to consume dietary guidelines for fruit and vegetables when they're on the high antioxidant diet. And the low antioxidant diet, they had to reduce their intake of things like fruit and vegetables, nuts, tea, red wine. So we, um, we call them high and low, but it actually represents guidelines versus what is the typical intake in the population that we're working with. The nutrient profile changed following that intervention and I acknowledge that there's lots of things that would have changed. Um, macronutrient intake didn't change nor did energy intake but micronutri micronutrient profile was altered. So in the high versus the low antioxidant diet there was an increase in beta carotene, in B group vitamins, in vitamin C and then this is plasma levels of alpha tocopherol. They were increased in the high compared to the low antioxidant diet. In terms of the clinical effect of this dietary change, this is the key outcome that I'd like you to focus on. We found that the time to exacerbation was decreased in people who were on the high antioxidant diet. So as I mentioned previously, asthmatics have these intermittent flare-ups of their asthma, and if, but if they had assumed this high antioxidant diet, the, the time for that, the next exacerbation to occur was increased. So another way of putting this is if people who are on the low antioxidant diet were 2.3 times more likely to have an asthma exacerbation at a point in time than people on the high antioxidant diet. And that was also linked with, again you can't really see that, but what, what that was also linked to changes in inflammation. So people on the low antioxidant diet also had an increase in their systemic inflammation, CRP, and an increase in their airway cell count. So I guess a really important point of this slide is that it seems that nutrient combinations are more effective in this setting than supplementing with isolated nutrients. If 
in a combination of antioxidants it is used, it seems to be more important that, than trying to isolate one particular nutrient. So to summarise what we've learnt about asthma and antioxidants, there certainly are antioxidant deficiencies in asthma that appear to be due to the disease process. Um, supplementation studies focusing on single nutrients have been disappointing. However, a whole food intervention using a combined um, approach led to improvements and in um, inflammation and also a reduction in the risk of asthma exacerbation. So if we go back to our initial um, slides where we, where we saw the, the fact that air pollution is a trigger of asthma exacerbations, then this is one approach to trying to um, prevent those damaging effects of air pollution. I guess the other important point to make here too is that we were using dietary manipulation and the high antioxidant diet that people were asked to assume, as I said, it's, it's equivalent to what the dietary guidelines are in Australia and similar to the US and um, worldwide, but only 5% of the population actually eat that way. So we were asking people to make this dietary change. We found it to be beneficial, but despite the fact that the pub public health messages have been harping on about these guidelines, you know, five serves of veg, two serves of fruit every day, it's been the target of so many different campaigns over the last 10 to 15 years. Despite that, still only 5% of the population are eating that way. So we need to look at other ways that we might be able to utilise to help improve the nutrient profile. Um, just briefly on um, antioxidants, omega-3 fatty acids, oh, sorry, asthma and omega-3 fatty acids. So Fernando mentioned um, that there have been some studies done in um, air pollution and omega-3 fatty acids. Um, in asthma, the data that's available using omega-3 supplementation is inconclusive. There aren't a lot of studies. Uh, they're quite small in size and um, some are not very um, well designed. So we're not in a position where we could say that omega-3 fatty acids would be helpful for asthma or to prevent an asthma exacerbation. But this is something that's really important future direction um, because if omega-3s and the associated anti-inflammatory properties that um, are ob obtained when you use omega-3s, if they could be used to prevent asthma exacerbations, then that could be a very um, helpful addition to this problem. Vitamin D, I mentioned vitamin D because this is another thing that has been quite popular in the asthma world. Vitamin D does have a lot of effects on immunity, and um, but most of the work that describes those effects is done in in vitro or preclinical models. In a clinical setting, there isn't a lot of evidence um, to describe the effects of vitamin D in asthma. There was one recent study that was um, a large study conducted in the US, which did see that, did, did report the observation that vitamin D use decreased the rate of first exacerbation in people who had an increase in their circulating vitamin D levels. Um, but that's the only ev evidence that's available to date. So to summarise that body of work, um, we have very clearly described ourselves and also there's lots of reports in the literature that asthma is linked to certain nutritional deficiencies. And they include vitamin C, vitamin E, selenium, carotenoids, omega-3 fatty acids and vitamin D. A lot of the work that's describing that is observation or epidemiological, um, but there are certainly lots of studies that support that link. Supplementation studies haven't supported the use of any particular individual nutrient to date. The studies that have been done have not been um, positive, but there is one study that now has shown that a combined approach to improving diet quality was beneficial in preventing asthma, exas asthma exacerbations. The idea of exploring nutrient combinations as a therapy for helping to um, manage asthma is a really important future direction. Also, it's important that 
appropriate outcome measures are used in these studies. So we've identified um, in our work that preventing exacerbation risk is an important outcome and we've demonstrated that it can be modulated using a nutritional approach so that as an outcome needs to be the focus of future work as well. And I'd just like to acknowledge a variety of in other co-investigators working on these projects, um, DSM for supporting the meeting and um, funding for the projects that I've described. Thank you. You mentioned moving to westernised countries increases the chance of a chance of an asthma attack. If I move myself to, say, Greenland, for example, can I get rid of my asthma? Um, there haven't been any studies that have looked at the reverse. So there's been migration studies that have followed people as they move to Western countries. I'm not aware of anything that's done the reverse. We would hypothesise that you could, yes, you could improve your asthma. And certainly you hear a lot of anecdotal stories um, in Australia, in the Hunter region where I come from, there's um, coal mining in the area and anecdotally a lot of people will say they have to move out of the area to help their kids, their, their children's asthma improved. But I'm not aware of any scientific studies that have actually you know, reported on that. I'd be happy to volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that's the case? Is it only the pollutants that will aggravate the disease or even colder regions like, like say, Greenland or some, somewhere where it's really cold? Yeah. Will the temperature affect the you know, uh, disease itself? Uh, temper you. Temperature isn't strongly linked to asthma, um, but there's multiple triggers. So air pollution is just one of multiple triggers. And so things like um, airborne allergens and viruses, like a lot of people when they get, a lot of asthmatics, when they get the common cold, rather than just having the usual symptoms that others would have, they, that will aggravate an asthma exacerbation. Um, yes, yeah, smoking, like cig exposure to cigarette smoke, those sort of things. Um, yeah, not so much temperature though. <laughs>